Moving day means that you and the things that matter to you are in for a big transition. There's a lot to figure out. New closets, different counter space, change of floor plan. No worries. CubeSmart is here, so you have a place for everything. It's our job to make self-storage as easy as possible. Online or in person, this is a self-storage experience that puts the focus on you because you matter to us. With self-storage that fits seamlessly into your life, you'll have plenty of peace of mind to unpack along the way. Click now to find a self-storage solution near you. Hey everyone, it's Jamie. Today, I'm highlighting a previous episode of Murderish. It's the case of Danielle Drouin and Michael Redlick, who'd been married almost 20 years. Though there was a significant age gap between the couple, that wasn't the unusual aspect of their relationship. Michael Redlick had previously been Danielle's stepfather. Against all odds, their controversial and rocky marriage lasted nearly two decades. It would all come to a grinding halt on January 11, 2019. That night, after a vicious argument, Michael was found dead in their multi-million dollar riverfront home. Was this deadly event the culmination of years of abuse? Or did something more sinister play a role in Michael's death? The opinions expressed in this episode do not necessarily reflect those of the Murderish podcast. Sensitive topics are discussed. Listener discretion is advised. Not all relationships start in a conventional way. Danielle Drohan was in her early 20s when she married a man more than 20 years older. The age gap wasn't the unusual part, though. Her husband, Michael Redlick, had previously been her stepfather. Against all odds, their rocky marriage lasted nearly two decades. It would all come to a grinding halt on January 11th of 2019. That night, after a vicious argument, Michael was found dead in their multi-million dollar riverfront home. Was this deadly event the culmination of years of abuse? Or did something more sinister play a role in Michael's death? This is Jamie, and you're listening to Murderish. Join me as I walk you through the case involving Michael Redlick. This case takes us to Winter Park, Florida, located in the Orlando and Kissimmee area. Winter Park is an upper middle class city known for its abundant parks and historic shopping district. After years of relocating, Michael and Danielle Redlick decided to call this central Florida suburb home. Danielle Justine Drohan was born on November 3, 1973 in Cleveland, Ohio. It appears her father wasn't part of her life. Danielle was raised by her mother, Kathleen Aquino, who everyone called Kathy. Kathy, who would go on to have another daughter four years later, worked several jobs to provide for her young children. Sometime in the mid-1990s, Kathy began dating Michael Redlick. Michael was emotionally supportive, good-natured, and financially stable. Born May 1, 1953, in Cleveland, Ohio, to Julius and Helen Redlick, Michael had a passion for sports from an early age. After college, he went on to have a long career in sports management. According to Fox 35, Michael's impressive career included marketing for the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, the Cleveland Browns, and the San Francisco 49ers. Around the time he was dating Kathy, Michael worked in administrative sales for the Memphis Grizzlies NBA basketball team. In early 1999, Kathy experienced a health crisis. She was diagnosed with late-stage breast cancer. The series of odd jobs she worked over the years didn't provide good health insurance to cover her treatment. So Michael stepped up and married Kathy so she could be added to his health insurance plan. According to People.com, friends of the couple said the marriage was more of a financial arrangement than an act of true love. Just three months after they legally married, Kathy passed away at the young age of 45. Both Michael and his stepdaughters were devastated by the loss, but they did their best to carry on with life. Shortly after turning 21, Danielle moved out and got a job at a local bar, while her 16-year-old sister, Melanie, remained under Michael's care. At one point, Michael reached out to Danielle for help raising her sister. Before long, 
Danielle was spending more time at the house her mom and Michael once shared. Michael also started visiting Danielle at work, and sometimes they attended concerts together. As their bond transitioned from stepfather and daughter to close friends, they started to develop romantic feelings for each other. In tune with the controversial nature of their relationship, Michael and Danielle kept it under wraps at first, but their romantic involvement was later revealed to disapproving family members. Despite how taboo it might have been, their three-year relationship made it clear to loved ones they were both in it for the long haul. Michael found great success in his career, while Danielle made a modest living working as a photographer. In November of 2001, Michael received an extremely lucrative promotion. He was named Vice President of Corporate Sales and Sponsorships for the Memphis Grizzlies. In this position, Michael developed substantial cross-promotional partnerships and boosted the team's sponsorship revenues exponentially, and he found himself in a much higher income bracket. As reported by the Daily Beast, the early years were mostly happy. On rare occasions, however, Michael exhibited some abusive behavior. The first time he physically assaulted Danielle was after a concert where she ran into an ex-boyfriend. The incident seemed to stem directly from jealousy. Like so many other women, Danielle probably made excuses for Michael's behavior or wrote it off as a one-time outburst of anger. In 2004, Michael and Danielle got married. Due to Michael's demanding career, the newlyweds moved to Memphis, California, and Indiana. They eventually settled down in Winter Park, Florida, where they purchased a house on the Mississippi River. With Michael's six-figure income, Danielle was able to quit her job and focus on starting a family with her new husband. The Redlicks went on to have two children, a girl named Jaden and a son named Sawyer, born five years apart. While the family enjoyed a comfortable life on Michael's salary, he was frequently out of town, leaving Danielle alone to raise the children, much like her own mother. The time spent apart created further conflicts between the couple, conflicts that grew more frequent over time. In 2013, Michael made some professional changes in order to appease his wife, who'd grown resentful of him. After spending more than 20 years working with NBA teams, Michael accepted a position at the University of Central Florida, or UCF. His position as Director of External Affairs and Partnership Relations involved leading the DeVos Sports Business Management Program. It was a major change that forced Michael to take a substantial pay cut. Dr. Richard Lapchik, the chair of UCF's DeVos program, would later confirm to the Orlando Sentinel that Michael's career shifted specifically to avoid disrupting his family life. Michael's students at UCF lovingly referred to him as Red. They appreciated his laid-back attitude and considered him a wealth of information on how to break into the pro sports industry. His home life, however, was a little less pleasant. Danielle claimed that her husband's anger resurfaced off and on after their children were born. She claimed that as he got older, his behavior got worse. In between violent arguments, Danielle and Michael took turns moving out of the house for short periods before coming back together. It was a toxic pattern that often played out in front of their children. They both had affairs, a temporary means of escape from their volatile dynamic. With Michael being in his early 60s, he struggled with erectile dysfunction and took Viagra. When the medication stopped working, he started testosterone injections, which Danielle said made him even more aggressive. Making matters worse, both of them were heavy drinkers, which only added fuel to their constant fiery disputes. One drunken incident led to legal troubles for Danielle. In January of 2018, she was arrested at a gas station in nearby Seminole County. She was charged with resisting an officer without violence and disorderly conduct. According to the Orlando Sentinel, Danielle said, I found a slew of emails of him carrying on with another woman, and it just crushed me. And I went out one night with some strangers, and I ended up in trouble. Danielle pleaded no contest to the charges. As a result, she was placed on probation. Then, in March of 2018, Danielle decided she'd had enough, and she filed for divorce. Citing court records, the Orlando Sentinel reported the divorce petition referred to the 13-year marriage as irretrievably broken and sought alimony, exclusive use of their Winter Park home, 
and shared custody of the children. Evidently, Danielle changed her mind because she continued spending time with Michael, who dodged being served the divorce papers, sometimes with Danielle's help. In November of 2018, a judge dismissed the divorce petition due to the documents never being signed. After that, the Redlicks carried on much like they had been. Their arguments continued with their children helplessly looking on. It was clear to those who knew the couple that a storm had been brewing between Michael and Danielle for years, but nobody thought their disagreements could turn deadly. On January 12th of 2019, at roughly 9.30 in the morning, dispatchers received a 911 call from Danielle. As reported by Fox 35 News, she told the operator that her husband appeared to be dead, saying, he's stiff and he might have had a heart attack. I don't know. During that same call, Danielle mentioned the possibility that Michael had stabbed himself to death. The operator was immediately suspicious of Danielle's story. According to Court TV, when asked why she hadn't called to report the emergency sooner, Danielle said, Yeah, um, I'm on probation and I was afraid and I didn't think anyone would believe me and I was just trying to get him to wake up. One of the parole conditions linked to her January 2018 arrest forbade her from consuming alcohol. Testing revealed that Danielle had alcohol in her system the night her husband died. Responding officers from the Winter Park Police soon arrived at the scene. Upon entering the residence, Officer John Stanford found Michael lying on his back near the front door. His arms were stretched outward in a T-shape and there was blood on his jeans. Towels close to his body were also stained with a large amount of blood. Amidst a trail of blood leading to the couple's bedroom, there were red circular marks on the floor, as if someone had tried to clean up the blood. The strong odor of bleach filled the house. Other responding officers noticed deep cuts on both of Danielle's wrists, which investigators quickly determined were self-inflicted. Paramedics transported her to a nearby hospital for overnight treatment. Luckily, the children hadn't been home to witness whatever happened. Police interviews were conducted from Danielle's hospital bedside to determine what events had led to Michael's death and Danielle's suicide attempt. By this time, Danielle had abandoned the heart attack scenario that she had mentioned during the 911 call. She maintained that after emerging from the bathroom, she had attempted CPR, but Michael had vomited. The issue was, no vomit was found at the scene. As referenced by the Orlando Sentinel, Sergeant Lisa Supat wrote in her initial report that Danielle said she was eating a burger from McDonald's when Michael took a bite and spit it in her face. Danielle claimed that the incident led to a physical altercation, during which she grabbed a serrated kitchen knife that Michael took away from her and then began making stabbing motions toward himself. Danielle said she then hid in the bathroom and came out when she heard her husband stop moving. When she came out, Danielle claimed she found Michael bloodied on the floor. She went to look for a phone but kept slipping on her husband's blood. She said she kept checking to see if he was still breathing, and then she grabbed some towels before collapsing next to Michael on the kitchen floor. Sergeant Supot's report continued, Danielle Redlick remembered lying next to the victim thinking, what am I going to do? Then woke up the next morning, tried to clean up some more, and finally called police at 9.30 a.m., 11 hours after she said the fight began. Moving day means that you and the things that matter to you are in for a big transition. There's a lot to figure out. New closets, different counter space, change of floor plan. No worries. CubeSmart is here, so you have a place for everything. It's our job to make self-storage as easy as possible. Online or in person, this is a self-storage experience that puts the focus on you because you matter to us. With self-storage that fits seamlessly into your life, you'll have plenty of peace of mind to unpack along the way. Click now to find a self-storage solution near you. Danielle's story made little sense to detectives, who immediately punched holes in her account. They were merely biding their time as they gathered evidence. Doctors debated over instituting the Baker Act. According to the Orlando Sentinel, the Florida law allows people considered to be a danger to themselves or others to be involuntarily committed to the psych ward. However, 
After overnight observation, Danielle was released from the hospital and considered by law enforcement to be the main suspect. Danielle's claim that Michael died of a heart attack was completely discredited. Dr. Sarah Zydowicz ruled Michael's death a homicide. As reported by the Law & Crime Network, she said the knife had pierced a major vein under his armpit and sunk into the top of his lung. Additionally, some of his injuries looked like defense wounds. There was bruising on his left arm and fingernail impressions on his left forearm. According to Court TV, he also had a cut underneath his eye and a bruise on the inside of his upper lip. In the medical examiner's opinion, there was no indication that Danielle had attempted CPR, as she'd claimed. Injuries that are sometimes inflicted during resuscitation efforts, such as chest bruising or broken ribs, were not present. According to Law & Crime, Dr. Zydowicz surmised Michael would have bled out within minutes. The physical evidence found at the scene was particularly incriminating. As reported by Fox 35 News, responding officers had come across blood-soaked towels and mops along with a five-gallon bucket filled with pinkish water. Swabs taken of blood droplets in the primary bathroom shower matched Michael's DNA. These findings prompted investigators to piece together a timeline. It seemed inexplicable that Danielle did not call for help sooner, unless she was the one responsible for Michael's death. Another interview offered a third version of events. Danielle claimed that Michael had attacked her and she had fought back in self-defense. As quoted by the Orlando Sentinel, Danielle told detectives, he found a text from another man to me. We had some issues, and last year, he basically cheated on me, and it was a big, long, drawn-out thing. And we finally came around to living together again and possibly trying to work it through. But I think that really wasn't happening, and in my mind, it was inevitably going to probably separate again. For the first time, Danielle was telling the truth, at least part of it. By probing into the couple's relationship and speaking with their children, the state's attorney's office were able to theorize how things escalated. On January 10th, just over 24 hours before his death, Michael discovered that his wife was exchanging messages with another man on a dating app called Meet Mindful. In response, he started drinking and followed Danielle around the house, shouting belligerently. She locked herself in the bathroom, but Michael broke down the door. Danielle said she managed to get out and left the house to stay with a friend. The heated argument distressed their 15-year-old daughter, Jaden, so much, she poured out any vodka her father had left in the bottle. According to the Orlando Sentinel, in interviews with detectives, Danielle said to Jaden over the phone, I said, you know, you may not want to pour all that out because I need him to pass out so I can come home at some point. 10-year-old Sawyer sent a text message to his mother later that night to let her know that his father had passed out. Danielle came home hoping this was just another fight that would get resolved after a good night's sleep. The next day, Michael sent Danielle text messages that seemed snide to her. She had hoped they could hash out the disagreement once he returned home, but the mean tone of his messages threw her off. Danielle was quoted by the Orlando Sentinel as saying, He started spewing, so I said, okay, you're not ready. You know, so maybe let's just give this another day or two. I didn't realize how much rage was going on there. After work on January 11th, Michael headed to Sawyer's school to meet up with his wife and their daughter. Their son, Sawyer, and one of his friends played on a flag football team and had a game scheduled for that evening. After the game, the boys planned to have a sleepover at the friend's house. Michael and Danielle's daughter, Jaden, also opted to sleep at a friend's house that night. When they returned home from the football game, Jaden said she watched her father pour himself a drink and knew that it might be another tense night of arguing between her parents. As quoted by the Orlando Sentinel, Danielle told detectives, it just started there. Since both children slept outside of the family home the night before, there were no witnesses to the events that followed. Even so, detectives tried their best to piece together the most plausible chain of events by interviewing the Redlick children. Jaden told investigators her parents had vastly different personalities. As reported by the Orlando Sentinel, she explained, 
When stuff would occur between my parents physically when they were arguing, it's because they just both had very extreme viewpoints on certain things. Citing police interviews with Jaden, the Orlando Sentinel detailed that it wasn't just Michael who became physically violent. Jaden recalled a mark left on her father's face that left behind an imprint of a ring. Interviews with Sawyer revealed similar observations. He called his parents alcoholics and said he'd seen them pushing and scratching at each other before. Sawyer described the tension between his parents when he left for a sleepover the night of their final argument. As quoted by the Orlando Sentinel, he told detectives they were not in a good state at that point. On the 12th, when Danielle finally called 911, both of her children suspected something was wrong. Jaden told authorities that when she stayed over at a friend's house, she was usually picked up first thing the following morning. This time, she didn't hear from either parent until 10.17 a.m. when Danielle sent a text message that read, Hang in there for a while. I'm dealing with stuff here. Best not to come home for a bit. On the morning of January 12th, Sawyer seemed distracted during a flag football game. It wasn't like his mom and dad not to show up to cheer him on. Sawyer told investigators he started to worry when a coach let him know that there were fire trucks outside of his house. Marsha Ingalis, the mother of Sawyer's friend, got a text message that morning from Danielle Redlick. As Marsha would later testify, Danielle messaged her about a family emergency and asked if Sawyer could stay there an extra day. Detectives also spoke to the Redlicks' neighbors. According to Court TV, one neighbor told the officers the couple had a rocky relationship and fought often. Court TV also revealed the same neighbors remembered Michael saying about his wife, as long as I hide the steak knives, everything will be fine. While there was no doubt Danielle's behavior seemed odd, there were still several pieces missing from the full picture. In order to establish a timeline, detectives obtained a search warrant for both Danielle's cell phone records and the login information for her dating app. This evidence ultimately refuted Danielle's initial claim that she hadn't called 911 sooner because she couldn't find her phone. Digital records showed that Danielle had logged into the dating app to check her messages at 7.22 a.m., more than two hours before she called to report Michael's death. Detectives were able to figure out that Danielle had created an account on the dating app in December of 2018, writing that she was separated and looking for a long-term relationship. In the weeks leading up to the fatal fight, Danielle had been exchanging messages with a man on the app named Mark. They engaged in light conversation before talking about potentially meeting up for a hike. But was this exchange enough motivation for Danielle to kill her husband? Or had Michael made Danielle believe her life was in danger and stabbing him was an act of survival? A rough timeline of events was developed by Winter Park Police based on the information they had collected. They determined the couple's quarrel began sometime around 10.30 p.m. on January 11th, based on the time Jaden headed over to her friend's house for the night. The Orlando Sentinel reported that based on Danielle's cell phone records, she had attempted to call 911 20 minutes later and then canceled the call. The following morning at 7.22 a.m., she opened up her dating app. A minute later, she used Google to research suicide methods. It was roughly two hours later when Danielle dialed 911. It seemed plausible she only did so because she had attempted suicide, not for Michael's sake. The Orange Osceola State's Attorney's Office had now gathered enough evidence to issue a warrant for Danielle Redlick's arrest. On February 6th of 2019, a little over three weeks after her husband's death, Danielle was taken into custody on charges of second-degree murder with a deadly weapon and tampering with evidence. She was held without bail at the Orange County Jail. Prior to her arrest, Danielle held a viewing and celebration of life church service for her late husband. With the news that she was the primary suspect in Michael's death, nobody knew what to think. Michael's former department chair, Dr. Richard Lapchik, released a statement to the Orlando Sentinel following the arrest. He said, My primary thought after today's news is that we are deeply saddened by it all, and our thoughts, prayers, and actions are focused on the children and the family and ways we can support them. Our students feel the same way. 
In the weeks following the death of his beloved colleague, Dr. Lapchik had received hundreds of emails from Michael's current and former students who were grieving the tragic loss. Dr. Lapchik told the Orlando Sentinel, I think they saw Mike really cared. He pushed them to do more than they thought they could do. Dr. Lapchik was particularly distraught after hearing of Danielle's arrest. He and his wife had reached out to Danielle and her children, even bringing over meals to the house a couple of times. If Danielle had suspected an upcoming arrest at the time, he couldn't tell. Everyone worried about Michael's kids, who'd lost a father and had a mother facing serious prison time. According to the Orlando Sentinel, Michael's former colleagues rallied together to start a college savings account for Jaden and Sawyer. Through the GoFundMe, they managed to raise almost $60,000. The Redlick children had already been through so much in their unstable household. Sadly, they still had a very long way to go before any semblance of peace could be found. The day after Danielle's arrest, a pretrial hearing highlighted prosecutors' key points. The charges against Danielle were based on three investigative findings. According to the Orlando Sentinel, the charges were backed up by the following evidence. Michael's body exhibited signs of abuse by his wife. Danielle had opened her dating app prior to notifying police. And evidence suggested Danielle used bleach to clean up her husband's blood. With that, the case against Danielle Redlick was strong enough to go to trial. Since she was viewed as a danger to the community, the judge ordered Danielle to continue being held without bail, and she wasn't allowed to see her kids. By April, Circuit Judge Dan Traver had relented and allowed supervised visits between Danielle and her children. Nobody could have imagined what was to come at trial. Jaden agreed to testify against her mother. As prosecutors prepared for trial, they looked into every possible angle for a motive, including exploring whether it was possible that Danielle had more to gain financially with Michael dead. Keith Durkin, a lawyer representing Michael's estate, quickly negated that theory. As detailed by the Orlando Sentinel, the couple had little in the way of cash assets. Both of their cars were leased, and they owed $800,000 on a mortgage and line of credit for their lavish home. The funds raised for Danielle's children by her late husband's co-workers would also be off-limits to her. As far as Assistant State Attorney Ryan Vescio could tell, there was also no life insurance policy for Danielle to collect. It seemed more and more like the killing was an act of passion in the heat of the moment. In February of 2020, state prosecutors offered Danielle a plea deal. In exchange for pleading guilty to manslaughter, Danielle could receive a reduced sentence of 10 years in prison. Danielle rejected the offer, insisting on her innocence and deciding that going to trial would be a better option. Hi, I'm Ryan Reynolds, owner of Mint Mobile. And I know it's hard to believe Mint can be any good for just $15 a month. So let's ask Wasim Iknabi, one of Mint's first customers, if he has any issues with Mint. No, the service has been great. And under my ownership, it's going to get even better. How? No clue. Still $15 a month though, right? Yep. To learn more and see our logo, go to mintmobile.com slash Spotify. New activation and upfront payment for three-month plan required. Taxes and fees extra. Additional restrictions apply. See mintmobile.com for full terms. The trial for what became known as the Kitchen Knife Murder began on June 9th, 2022. If the Orlando-based jury found Danielle Redlick guilty, she faced life in prison. As reported by Fox News, defense attorney Catherine Conlin adopted the self-defense angle and didn't try to deny that her client had held the knife. In her opening statements, Conlin was quoted by People.com as saying, Danielle Redlick did stab Michael Redlick. She had no choice but to defend her life. You'll hear about a violent attack in the kitchen. Danielle reacted in confusion, despair, and trauma. State prosecutor Sean Wiggins took a more sensationalized approach. He described the home as a horror scene. According to Fox News, he alleged, the evidence will show that from the start, this defendant did everything she could to avoid responsibility for her actions. Conlin made every effort to appeal to jurors' sense of compassion, painting her client as a victim and Michael 
as a violent and controlling instigator. As quoted by WCTV, Conlon told the courtroom that the only option she had in that kitchen was to take action. Based on the defense team's theory, only one of them was getting out of that kitchen alive, and Danielle chose to fight for her own life. Stuart James, forensic consultant and blood pattern expert, spoke about his analysis of the crime scene. As cited by Court TV, James believed that blood found on the floor and walls was in the process of drying during the extensive cleaning attempts made by the defendant. The fact that Michael's socks were saturated with blood indicated that he was upright when the blood made contact with his feet. McDonald's containers smeared with blood had also been found at the scene, which aligned with one of Danielle's accounts. According to Court TV, based on the blood patterns, James thought it was odd that Michael had walked into the bedroom, then the bathroom, and finally the living room. James Montgomery, a digital forensic investigator, had examined Danielle and Michael's communications during the investigation. According to Court TV, Montgomery found evidence that Danielle had deleted eight SMS messages that couldn't be recovered. The information contained in those text messages may have been incriminating, but we'll never know what they said. In a surprising move, Danielle took the stand in her own defense, a rarity in court cases of this magnitude. Danielle gave testimony for two consecutive days. WESH News described Danielle as being very composed as she spoke of the deadly escalation resulting in Michael's death. She told the jury how Michael flew into a jealous rage and lunged for her in the kitchen after their son's game. As reported by WESH News, Danielle testified, that's when he grabbed my hair and slammed my head into the stovetop. She claimed Michael had been trying to strangle and smother her before she took out the knife and stabbed him in the shoulder. During cross-examination, prosecutors questioned Danielle as to why she didn't have any injuries if Michael had attacked her. According to WESH News, the defense countered by stating, she doesn't have to have injuries. She just has to reasonably believe that his violent attack against her will cause death or bodily harm. Prosecutors did their best to portray Danielle as immature and impulsive. As reported by Court TV, they cited an argument between the couple that involved Michael taking away his wife's phone. Danielle had reacted by egging Michael's car. State prosecutors also wanted her to be perceived as cold and avoidant. Rather than calling 911, Danielle had tried to clean up her husband's blood, took a nap, and researched how to slit her wrists. As quoted by WESH News, Prosecutor Wiggins said, one of the reasons you slit your wrists is because you didn't want to have to answer for what you did. I suppose that could be one. According to the Daily Beast, at one point, Danielle broke down in tears, saying that she loved her husband and never meant to kill him. Several family friends took the stand for the prosecution, hoping to cast Danielle in a less favorable light. Peter Dybell had become close with Michael when they coached a baseball team together. As reported by WKMG Orlando, on January 11th, Dybel said that it seemed like something was bothering Michael and Danielle seemed off. Marcia Ingalis, the mother of one of Sawyer's friends, gave similar testimony. When asked to describe the defendant's demeanor on the night of the fight, according to WESH News, Ingalis said, she seemed irritated, upset, something was on her mind. During the week-long trial, two jurors had to be replaced. They kept dozing off in the middle of testimony. The judge didn't think it would result in a fair trial if members of the jury were napping during crucial testimony, such as forensic exhibits. Perhaps the most anticipated testimony came from Jaden, Michael and Danielle's daughter. She agreed to take the stand on the condition that she wouldn't be recorded or have her face appear in the press. Jaden, who was 18 years old at the time of the trial, detailed her parents' unstable relationship. As documented by WKMG News, Jaden said her parents had been viciously arguing for a year before her father's death. She said he had moved out of the family home in April of 2018, but had moved back in by October. She claimed her father was always the peacemaker, rallying for her family to be living together again. 
According to WKMG News, she said, I remember certain times where he would come by and bring her flowers and little gifts while they weren't living together. For a while after her father moved back in, her parents really seemed to be getting along. But on January 10th, 2019, Jaden said her mother warned her about a major conflict. As cited by WKMG News, Jaden said, My mother told me, I believe it was the day before he passed away, that she and my dad had been arguing and that he found a message on her phone from another man and that things might be off when he gets home from work. Jaden testified that the last time she saw her father alive, he apologized about arguing in front of her and told Jaden he loved her. Then, Jaden recalled an interaction with her mother just before her arrest. The mother and daughter had been sitting on the front porch when Jaden flat out asked her mother what had happened that night. According to Fox 35 News, Jaden remarked, I remember her exact words were, the autopsy said he had a heart attack. It seemed Danielle's own daughter had lost faith in her mother's innocence at that point. She believed deep down that her father's death wasn't an accident or an unfortunate medical event. The prosecution leaned heavily on the fact that Danielle had waited 11 hours to report the death of her husband. State prosecutor Sean Wiggins said that decision only cemented the idea she was looking for a way out of the marriage. As quoted by People.com, he said, she was not interested in a life with Mr. Redlick. She was never going to make the relationship work. She was done. But defense attorney Andrew Parnell countered in closing remarks by harping on the couple's power imbalance. As quoted by Court TV, he said, their relationship went from parent to partner, but not really. They are not partners, and it was about control. With no witnesses and limited physical evidence, the state rested their case, wondering if what they'd presented would be enough for a conviction. On June 16, 2022, the eight-member jury panel deliberated Danielle's fate for more than two hours. To the surprise of many, they found her not guilty of second-degree murder, but guilty of evidence tampering. Danielle cried out of relief after the controversial verdict was read aloud. As reported by WCTV, she even thanked each juror as they exited the courtroom. Her attorney, Catherine Conlon, remarked to WCTV, very happy with the verdict, she's happy to go home. One of the jurors commented about the trial outcome. The juror told WESH2 News, when you have a history of abuse and so many other factors and you can't say 100%, because this is somebody's life is being determined, then we can only do the best we can. Some of the people involved in the trial, especially those close to Michael, were extremely upset by the verdict. One of his friends who'd testified, Peter Diebel, believed that Danielle Redlick had evaded justice. He said to WESH2 News, this woman is completely guilty. Mike was made out on the stand to be a monster, and Mike was not a monster. He was a teddy bear. He wasn't perfect by any stretch of the imagination. There were any number of ways that prosecutors could have shown that the aggressor in that family was the mother, and they chose not to. On June 17, 2022, Danielle posted the $15,000 bond set by the judge. A sentencing hearing is scheduled for August 5th of 2022. Danielle faces sentencing for evidence tampering and violating her parole. Thanks so much for joining me on this episode of Murderish. Make sure you're following me on Instagram and TikTok at Jamie on Air. That's J-A-M-I on Air on Instagram and TikTok. If you'd rather listen to the podcast with no interruptions, sign up for Murderish Behind the Mic on Patreon. As a patron, you can get access to bonus content, ad-free episodes, and other cool perks. To sign up for Murderish Behind the Mic, visit Murderish.com or just go to Patreon.com and search for Murderish there. If you're looking for more podcasts to listen to, I host another true crime podcast called Dirty Money Moves Women in White Collar Crime. Dirty Money Moves follows my investigation of a woman I met a few years ago, a woman who turned out to be a prolific scam artist. It's a wild story that even has ties to the Michael Jackson scandal. You can subscribe to Dirty Money Moves wherever you're listening right now. There are a bunch of episodes for you to binge. 
If you're enjoying the podcast, please leave Murderish a positive rating and review in any podcast app. I want to say a big thank you to everyone who contributed to making this episode. You can find their names in the episode notes. And remember, listening to this podcast doesn't make you a murderer. It just means you're murder-ish. It's never been easier to help preserve the simple joys that we love about this world. With Clean Choice Energy, switching to clean electricity is one of the simplest ways you can help the environment. It only takes two minutes to sign up. Visit cleanchoice.com slash podcast to learn more.